Hello, good morning from all of you here in Brazil. Good afternoon from those who are joining us from uh, Europe. I'm very happy to announce that this is our uh, second uh, webinar from this PNI series that uh, we have been organizing. And uh, we have such an important and interesting topic uh, today, uh, bringing the issue of cyber risks in shipping. My name is Lucas. I am a partner of uh, Kincaid. And today I'm going to bring uh, a team of experts and specialists on the topic to share their knowledge and their experience with you. Uh, I appreciate for all of those who would like to add comments on questions, you may feel free to use the chat and we will try to address as most questions as possible in the end uh, as we have, uh, if we have sufficient time for that. Otherwise, you can always uh, keep in touch with the speakers or for ourselves and we can continue the discussion in other, uh, in other platforms. The topic of today is uh, it's not only interesting from, from the current scenario that we have, but also, and probably uh, for our foreign colleagues joining us here today, they might not be aware that uh, we still have in Brazil, uh, in effect, uh, our commercial code regulating a lot of the maritime and shipping issues. And our commercial code, which is still in effect, is dated of 1850. So it is a very old code, still in effect from a time where vessels were actually sailing ships powered by wind. And uh, we still have, in theory, some legal provisions stating that the vessel must sail from the port at the first favorable wind. So it's something totally unimaginable for us nowadays. Uh, and as it was unimaginable for the legislator back then in the 19th century to regulate uh, cyber risks and uh, these sort of uh, new technology. Uh, the code does not bring, of course, any specific provision related to cyber risks, uh, but just the general care that the ship owner must have with the vessel, which still applies actually. Uh, nonetheless, the industry has developed a lot over the years and it's uh, not uh, new that uh, as it usually happens with, especially in the shipping industry, that new practices, new technologies uh, come before the legislation can be adapted. Uh, and this might be an issue also here today on the topic of cyber risks, uh, as technology has developed a lot. And uh, of course, our old commercial code could not anticipate that. So uh, talking about cyber risks, I will be happy to introduce you here today, a team of specialists from whom you will be hearing about. Uh, we will have here uh, on the event with us, José Carlos Elias. Uh, Elias is a lawyer graduated by University of Sao Paulo. He has management trainings by the London Business School and Cranfield University in the UK. He has almost 30 year career in shipping and logistics. He's a managing director of Altera Infrastructure since 2017, and is the current president of the Norwegian Brazilian Chamber of Commerce. Uh, as a second speaker, we'll have Gisele Villanueva, uh, who joined Ship Owners uh, PNI Club in May 2014 and primarily assists members with their PNI matters in the America region. Since qualifying as a solicitor, Gisele also assists the wider membership of their FDD disputes. And as of November 2019, she also manages the club's correspondent network. Uh, Giselle has completed her PNI qualification and is a fluent speaker in Spanish. And as our third speaker of the day, we will have Lars Benjamin Vold, who has 10 years' experience with the Norwegian Armed Forces, most of which he spent in the Norwegian Special Forces. Uh, so please don't mess up with Lars. Uh, be careful with the <laughs> questions you pose to him. Uh, and he has a Bachelor of Science in Finance and over four years' experience working 
with, within the Norwegian Shipowners Mutual War Risks Insurance Association, DNK, in the areas of security and contingency preparedness, cybersecurity, and digital development. Uh, Norwegian, uh, Lars is uh, representing the Norwegian Maritime Cyber Resilience Center, uh, also known as Norma Cyber, uh, which was established from January 1st of the present year and assists Norwegian shipping and maritime companies within cybersecurity. The center delivers a system for effective information sharing together with other proactive services that Lars will be able to talk about. And joining me as a co-moderator and uh, in charge of posing some of the questions uh, here today, we will have Ricardo Fernandes, who is the executive director of the Norwegian Ship Owners Association in Brazil since 2012. Ricardo served for over 30 years in the Brazilian Navy until retiring as a Navy commander. He has a master's and a post-graduation in business management and also a master's science degree and a graduation degree in nautical science from the Naval War College and the Naval Academy, respectively. So uh, I will pass the word first to Elias, uh, wishing you all a, a good event, a good morning. And Elias, the floor will be yours, uh, and we'll be very happy to hear about practical experience on cyber threats from a ship owner's perspective. Well, good morning, all. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, uh, first, uh, just a small correction. I'm no longer the president of NPCC, but I just uh, finished my term. But I have the honor of being the vice president of Abram, where Ricardo acts as the executive director. Slightly intimidated for so many military tough guys here, so I will try to behave myself because I'm definitely no match for that. Uh, I will, I'm hardly an expert uh, about cybersecurity, but uh, I will try to share some industry experiences. This is a hot topic, uh, of course, for, for, for everyone, uh, not only in shipping, but of course, this is our industry. Uh, this is a serious and real threat that we face, and I don't think this is going to get any easier going forward. So let's uh, have a, a nice chat about it, uh, exchange ideas. I think exchanging experiences is always good in this, uh, in this scenario. So I'll try to share my screen here, screen here so to start testing my, my skills. Here we go. So let's see if you can. Can you see it? Yes, we, we can see it. Uh, yes, that's right. OK. So uh, before we start, just a few reminders for us. Uh, in our industry, of course, uh, safety is the first uh, and foremost priority for everyone. And it's unescapable if we're going to talk about anything today that we mentioned uh, COVID. Uh, we hope everybody's safe and healthy. Uh, it's always nice to remember some of the safety measures that can prevent uh, the contamination. Um, vaccination is luckily progressing in Brazil, maybe as not as fast as we want it to, but it's progressing, it's progressing well here in Rio. So if uh, someone in the audience is getting close to take your shot, please do that. Please remind, please uh, remind your neighbors and friends and whoever you are in contact with to take their shot uh, whenever the time comes and take the second shot because this is a real problem now in Brazil that people take the first shot and then go, don't go back for the second shot. Um, I hope the next seminar can be presential in that sense that we take this virus first and avoid the, cybers, the cyber virus later. So starting uh, with some uh, elements, I think the, the human element uh, is one of the key risks uh, when it comes to cybersecurity. You know, uh, it's not only about direct attacks, but it's using social tricks, social engineering techniques. We see that 97% of the attacks go with that. So we see phishing emails, 
uh, phone calls, uh, different techniques to uh, people who are usually in good faith, are usually busy. Uh, and, and that's when some of our main uh, security breaches happen. Um, 95% are caused by human error. So we need to keep training people all the time. Um, a staggering number that 88% of the organizations worldwide experienced phishing attempts in 2019. Cyber uh, crime increased 600% in 2020 due to COVID-19. People were home, people more distracted, people away from their servers, sometimes weaker, uh, weaker networks. So that's a, that's a threat. Um, 92% of malware delivered by email, email gets to everyone, including ships. 68% of the business leaders feel that their cyber security risks are increased. I think I share that. I think many share that this is, this is a real problem. One data breach in average costed 3.86 million in 2020. The average time to identify that the breach was 207 days, which is also uh, an amazing number. So it takes a long time sometimes to identify that your, your data has been breached. Um, top top uh, security reasons, let's say cybersecurity breaches are weak and stolen credential passwords, backdoor applications, vulnerabilities, malware, and social engineering. Uh, a big uh, and very visible example that we have faced recently was this uh, ransomware attack uh, in the US. Uh, we saw how bad it, it was and how much damage it has created and how much concern. They have, uh, uh, those reports uh, have uh, uh, indicated that the, 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 their systems, financial systems are being targeted. Um, Colonial took certain files offline to contain the threat, which, is, which was a good thing, but the actions halted all operations and affected uh, IT systems. Um, this was caused by a criminal gang called the Dark Side. So they infiltrated on the Colonial's network, stole and locked data on some computers and servers, demand a ransom to spread it out. This is a very common, uh, this is a very common event. They paid, and we heard recently that some of this money has been recovered, $4.4 million to unlock their data. Uh, seems like industrial and OT systems uh, were not affected. So their hardware controlled by, by, uh, by software were not affected. There's much information still to be obtained. I think this is also an important point um, for the companies, including ourselves. It's not always easy to share all the information related to those attacks because you also don't want to share your strategies to contain those, those, uh, uh, those attacks. So we may not ever get the full details of this. Uh, I am in shipping, but I'm also in the energy sector. So uh, our company operates at PSOs and shuttle tankers for the, for the oil industry. And we see here that the energy sector is uh, in the top five uh, targeted industry for cyber criminals. Again, COVID has made uh, that uh, grow, the, 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 the cyber attacks grow exponentially. Uh, people are working from home mostly, people are more vulnerable, people are alone. I have seen, we have had one experience uh, of a, a, a cyber crime uh, that affected our office last year, uh, and that was a banking fraud. And, and I'm sure it would have happened if the person was uh, in an office environment, because the, the criminals uh, called the person uh, pretending to be a bank and, and they kept her on the phone for a long time. I would say that if she was in the office, uh, someone would have noticed that, but she was on her own. Everything seemed uh, very legitimate. 
so much that the, the, the bank recognized that there was a weakness in, in their system. So the financial loss, uh, which was not uh, uh, not nearly as big as what we're talking about here, has been compensated by the bank. So the big uh, the big issue uh, now working from home. Oh, technology! No, uh, technology evolves fast. Uh, we have really fast. We do have uh, equipment at home that uh, seems uh, from old age still works, but seems so from old ages. Uh, if you compare to everything new that comes on, on, on nearly basis. And those equipment may be more vulnerable, uh, less upgradable for, for additional security. Um, we do, here is a list of uh, main entry points or risks for ransomware. Um, email, uh, usually mass deployment of emails, attachments, links to virus, malware, phishing. We do receive emails sometimes that seem to be coming from our own, uh, from our own organization, that's a danger. So if you don't look really in detail into the address where the email comes from, you may be prone uh, to click on those emails. Uh, and that's, 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 uh, that can be a really uh, bad uh, event. Um, recently, we got emails saying, well, HR Altera wants you to do this. People tend to, to that, with that social engineering, if you get to an email from HR, you tend to go and, and see what's going on. So uh, those guys are, are smart and, and use uh, many different tricks. Um, again, social engineering, um, USB sticks are, I think we see less and less of those, but still a, a bad, uh, a very weak point. Phone calls, as I mentioned with the bank, vendors, external parties. Uh, threats, blackmail, people uh, pretending uh, to, to have uh, kidnapped someone in the family or to have uh, pictures of someone, those kind of things. Insiders, employees, very common in the banking world. Internet, um, downloading executable services, advertisements, uh, exploits from software, exposed services, uh, software assessed uh, on the internet. Exploiting technical vulnerabilities, as I mentioned, legacy systems, outdated technology. Uh, some events, I mean, just to share experience, uh, uh, Nemolet virus, uh, try to gain access to the, the infected entire system environment, known to have, have been used as mass selling access to criminals, came to our system through an email containing an attachment with word macro files. So opening an attachment with macros. Typically you have uh, macros blocked, but uh, sometimes again, smart social engineering make people open those and uh, disable the blocks and open the files. Malware websites, uh, we had different uh, malware causing system overload. Um, that was to access to suspicious websites, enable to surf in using private accounts or equi and equipment on company network. So there are problems, uh, of course, we have to keep training people uh, about what is acceptable and not acceptable. Uh, websites, downloads, personal equipment, uh, mingling your personal network with the company network. Um, as we mentioned, um, one of the biggest vulnerabilities is the human interface. Uh, we are all somehow vulnerable and training, training, awareness. I think that uh, is getting even more important every day. Um, then some industry examples, not from, from us. Uh, uh, one of the things today is that uh, ships are completely automated, you know, uh, which is great. Uh, adds uh, security, you have redundancy, and, and uh, uh, you have uh, capabilities that uh, one couldn't dream of uh, a couple of decades ago. But also it creates uh, vulnerabilities. So um, now the, the navigation charts are, are electronic. Um, so with a distraction and, and uh, 
uh, ship was a ship was uh, using uh, was under the conduct of a pilot when the Actis and Voyage performance computers crashed. Pilot was on the bridge. Computer failures briefly created a distraction uh, to the watch officers. However, the pilot and the master worked together to focus the bridge and team on the safe navigation by visual means and radar. When the computers were rebooted, it was apparent that the operating systems were outdated and unsupported. The master reported those computer problems were frequently referring the issues as gremlin and that repeated requests from servicing from the ship owners have been ignored. It's a clear case of how simple servicing and attention uh, to the ship by management can prevent mishaps. So updating the system, making sure that uh, they are safe. Then it's an access uh, to a, by a bunker surveyor for to a ship's administrative work. Uh, a dry bulk ship in a port uh, had just completed bunkering operations. The bunker surveyor boarded the ship and requested the permission to access the computer to the engine room to print documents for signature. The surveyor inserted a USB driver to the computer and immediately uh, introduced malware on the ship's administrative network. The malware went under the, undetected until a cyber assessment was conducted, conducted on the ship later. And after the crew reported a computer issue affecting business networks. Um, here, the emphasis is to prevent uh, uh, the need to, uh, for procedures to prevent and restrict the use of USB devices on board, including especially those belonging to visitors. Um, we, we don't necessarily know it could be completely unintentional but uh, yeah those are very unsafe uh, ways of uh, managing that so we do have that uh, i think those examples uh, they make the operations uh, uh, more challenging you know uh, as i said technology will uh, make shipping uh, stronger and, and, and more uh, capable, but it, we need to be careful with those events. So mitigating actions, awareness training, as I mentioned before, uh, adhering to company policies, terminating all technology that represents risk. So we need a safety first culture also when it comes to information security. As I mentioned in the beginning, safety is definitely our priority, always safety of people, no environment, assets, but uh, we also need to, uh, and that's the message we, we also give internally, how can you and your team contribute towards safeguarding our information and assets? With, of course, uh, is also another repercussion of uh, data breaches, uh, which is related to the data protection law. So we need to protect <clears throat> the data from our employees, customers, suppliers, etc. Uh, we were not involved, but a customer of ours had a data breach and they had uh, information from our people were leaked. We know the customer worked very hard and luckily there were no uh, significant consequences, but the impact on their operations, the impact of the potential liability that this could have created is immense. So they had a team working, a huge team working for weeks to resolve that upper bridge. So something that on, some, sometimes it doesn't only affect our own organization, but affect organizations that are connected uh, to us somehow as a customer, as a supplier or our employees. So uh, that was meant to be a short presentation uh, a discussion. I hope um, it was clear. And then of course I, I go back to the, uh, to the presentation, to the, to the seminar. So thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks, Elias. We are the one to, to thank you and appreciate uh, you from bringing the view from a company's perspective and the ship owner's perspective of such an important topic. And especially uh, you've raised it uh, pretty well, uh, the, the concern that had to be enlarged uh, in focus you had to make when we were hit by this pandemic and all of a sudden all the controls and, and and measures that were adopted to, to safeguard and protect 
from the company's perspective, you had to enlarge that to protect also the, the environment, people working out of their homes from personal computers, uh, especially in the beginning, uh, before we could adapt more easily. So it was a, a big concern and there were big rooms also for, for cyber risks and threats coming out of that. And I think uh, situation is getting more and more enhanced uh, with time, but uh, it's still something that uh, will probably last now forever, uh, working out of uh, not only within the company's structure in your office, but also working abroad remotely from home, from mobile devices. Uh, it was very good to hear your presentations. Uh, and uh, I will be also happy now to, to pass the word to our second speaker of the day, bringing a, a PNI perspective, uh, Gisele Villanueva. Um, she will talk about the cyber risks from a PNI club's perspective. And then Gisele, feel free to share your screen, your presentation, and your microphone is yours. Thank you very much, Lucas. Um, so yes, my name is Giselle. I'm a senior claims executive at the Ship Owners P&I Club, and um, I'm very pleased to be a part of the uh, P&I series that Kincaid are hosting today. As Jose Elias uh, already mentioned, cyber is such a buzzword at the moment, um, and our industry is no different to this. So uh, today, as the title on screen suggests, uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of an insight into the different ways that a p &I club comes across this topic of, of cyber. Um, from a personal perspective, I've been at the club for seven years now, and I've definitely seen how cyber in a multitude of forms is becoming a bigger part of the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So in terms of what uh, I propose to run through with you today, um, I will be giving you a little bit of an introduction to um, who we are and uh, the, sort of the position that we have in the PI world. I'll move on to talk about um, how cyber relates to our members, our, the ship owners that, that we assist, and then finish off with how cyber relates to our correspondents, indeed any third party provider that, that we work with on a regular basis. So starting with the bigger picture, um, at Ship Owners, well, firstly, we were one of the uh, initial clubs um, of, of the international group to, to be founded. Um, and of those 13 clubs that exist today, we are the largest in terms of numbers uh, of vessels entered with us. Um, so that currently stands at around 33,800. Um, and of those vessels, we are specialists um, or market leaders in small and specialist crafts. Hopefully that's um, reflected in the breakdown that you can see on screen. Um, and I thought it was particularly relevant to share this slide as it includes the fact that we currently have 30 uh, ship owners of autonomous vessels that we insure at the moment. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, what that cover looks like um, in a moment. Now, homing in a little bit more on this part of the world, your part of the world, I also just wanted to highlight that we have been a long-standing club that works with Central and South America, hopefully demonstrated by the number of members that we have there at the moment. And indeed, Brazil has served uh, to be a, a historically um, sort of loyal partner with us. Uh, one of our oldest members at the club uh, has been with us for over 40 years and is a Brazilian account. So um, it's a particular pleasure to be able to um, interact with, with this market today. So now that I've given a little bit more context of what we do, what, what, where we stand in, in the wider P&I world, um, I wanted to talk about how cyber relates to our members. And I mean, Jose Elias did a very good 
job at pinpointing the fact that this industry is moving towards a more digital world. We have autonomous vessels, like I mentioned, and generally speaking, more technologies on board vessels. Um, and so naturally, owners have started to ask, well, what can the P&I cover that has existed for so long do to protect us against these risks that, not to say they're new, but they're certainly um, more prominent now than, than ever before. Um, so moving with that in mind, I thought it would be useful to discuss the club rules, so standard P&I cover and what these cyber risks, how they interact with, with P&I cover. Uh, I think the important starting point is when we're talking about the club rules, there is no cyber specific exclusion contained in the rules, um, other than in relation to electronic bills, um, there is no cyber exclusion. So what that means is that you can have a variety of p &I claims that um, have a cyber element and, are there and, and can still be capable of falling within p &I cover. Uh, I think I, um, the example I was going to use is actually very similar to a scenario that Elias included in his presentation. And just to kind of bring it into the context of P&I, let's suppose that a crew member uses a corrupted USB stick on the bridge system on board their vessel. And uh, so this USB stick, it's corrupted, it's got malware, and as a result, the crew are, um, they lose control of the vessel. And that leads to a collision or a, you know, a P&I liability that has arisen. Now, the fact that malware was causative to this incident um, would not present a complication from a club cover perspective. Um, obviously, you know, the, the caveat would be it's all dependent on the specific facts of an incident. But taking that as a sort of uh, hypothetical scenario, hopefully it demonstrates that um, an incident like that, that um, has led to a P&I liability could still be one that we as a, a club can assist a ship owner with. Whilst we're on the topic of club rules, I did want to just highlight um, two areas of cover that um, clubs uh, principally exclude uh, these, these types of risks. And what I'm referring to are uh, war and terrorism risks and also biochemical risks. Now, the default position is that these, um, these aspects of the industry are, are not covered within um, uh, protection and indemnity insurance. Now, you can buy extensions that provide uh, additional cover um, to bring these within uh, your sort of shield of insurance. However, it's important to note that although these extensions exist and that you can purchase them in addition to your standard PI cover, there are certain cyber related incidents that would lead to these um, being excluded once again. So to put that into context, if, for example, a vessel's system was infiltrated by way of a cyber attack and used as a weapon in war or in a um, sort of terrorist attack, that would fall outside of PMI cover. Similarly, uh, a vessel that is used to harm um, by way of you know, biochemical risks and is carried out through a cyber attack, again, that would fall outside of P&I cover. So that's broadly speaking, the position under the club rules, um, which uh, is from a perspective of ship owners. Um, and I think uh, it's important to mention that 
whilst the club rules in a way accommodate to um, uh, cyber risks, um, we wanted to further this um, uh, sort of reach to our to the ship owning community. And so uh, we have uh, a specific policy that deals with autonomous vessels. Um, the policy was uh, created a few years ago, um, and we're proud to say that we were the first PI club to introduce such a policy. And it really was in recognition of the um, increasing number of autonomous vessels in the shipping industry. And so we took the opportunity to discuss with manufacturers, operators and owners in this sector um, and really try and get an understanding of the needs that there are, the insurance needs that there are. Um, and uh, yeah, ultimately we're able to develop a, a written policy. Um, I've included here, it's an all risks policy. So what that means is it provides uh, cover for all p &I related risks. I've included some examples in, in the list on screen, um, but essentially it should pair up very nicely um, with what uh, we recognise as standard p &I liabilities. I think we, you know, we're, we're definitely in the infancy of this kind of cover. Um, so it's we're, we're very excited to see uh, the uptake. As I mentioned, we have 30 um, accounts already. Um, and yeah, we are certainly excited to see how the, um, the policy um, kind of responds going forward and, and noting how the industry is moving towards a more digital world. It's, it's an area that we're, we're wanting to keep a close eye on. Having spoken now a little bit about cyber and our members, um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the practical side of how we consider cyber when we're working on a day-to-day -day basis on our claims with our correspondents and generally our third party providers abroad. Um, like has been mentioned, many of us um, are still working remotely and I think this is going to be um, very, the norm for a long time. Um, and so it is definitely from a club's perspective, um, we've wanted to recognize that uh, by having an increased online presence and that means you know more people working away from the office more people working online um, that there are certain vulnerabilities associated with that um, and so we we really want to make sure that we're on top of those vulnerabilities um, and, and addressing those so when you think or when we have been asked to think about what are these risks that a club encounters? Um, I've picked three, which um, are more or less in keeping with the previous presentation from, from an owner's perspective. We would agree, human error for us continues to be um, the biggest risk. Um, and then we have phishing attacks. And this is something that as a club we've seen, as an international group of PI clubs we have seen, um, and we know that our third party providers out there um, have also fallen foul of, of, of phishing attacks. Um, the other one I wanted to mention was unpatched systems. So this relates to software um, that may have security flaws. Um, and there are certain uh, steps that uh, certainly at ship owners we have tried to implement to mitigate both um, or rather all of these risks on screen. So in terms of mitigating risks, what does this mean in the context of a club? Well, it involves staff training, um, but regular and also ensuring that we have written policies that are in place so that staff can revisit 
remind themselves exactly what is expected um, and just to make sure that they are as informed as possible uh, to identify risks, um, cyber risks that they may come across in their day to day jobs. Um, we also have cyber security officers. Um, so here at Ship Owners, we actually split cyber risks into different departments. So um, there will be cyber security officers throughout the claims department, the underwriting department, our finance department. Um, and it's certainly not just uh, a role that is given to uh, our IT team. It is, it's a risk that is spread across the club and we make sure that there are individuals that are a point of contact for the rest of the staff um, to help them uh, with queries, concerns, uh, on this area. In terms of phishing attacks, um, we certainly encourage people to be skeptical of emails. I know that hackers and hacking software is ever sophisticated and it's a little bit of a, you know, it can be a bit of a catch up game as to what the latest um, risk out there is when it comes to phishing attacks. Um, but for us, I think the, the biggest change that we implemented was the way that we share information online. Um, so that is both in terms of emails and on our website, uh, our numbers, our email addresses, these are all shared um, by way of, of graphics rather than just text on the basis that we understand it to be slightly harder for that information to be um, copied and therefore utilised in, in the wrong way. Um, however, it's, it's not, you know, a, a bulletproof system and, and um, it, with the uh, speed in which this cyber attacks can develop. Um, it's important for us to keep in a, a log of the different breaches that we've experienced, identify any trends, identify any areas with, within the business that perhaps need um, uh, some reinforcement. Um, and that leads on quite nicely actually to patch management and what we've done to and what we continue to do to make sure that our software is um, as robust as possible. Um, in this industry, it's almost a prerequisite that you need to be available 24 seven. So we run business continuity tests to make sure that in the event that uh, there is some sort of infiltration, that the um, interruption to the business is kept to a minimum. And this can involve um, bringing in external firms, uh, almost inviting uh, them to try and hack into our system. And this is often the best way, uh, at least we found, to uh, identify any flaws and areas that um, we need to make sure are uh, improved. So in looking at the risk profile of the club, um, I, I also wanted to mention that financial transactions is something that we deal with on a daily basis. Uh, we're trying to handle and or settle claims for our members. And this, in, by, by the nature of, of the, the job, it means that there is a lot of money that is being remitted. And um, it, it's been really, really important to try and make sure that these financial transactions are protected as much as possible. Because with any payment, you wanna make sure that it goes to the right individual. And therefore um, we have implemented very enhanced security checks um, when sending money uh, outside of, of the club. Uh, I'm sure um, if there are any correspondents uh, listening in today, they might uh, sort of relate to not only ship owners, but other PI clubs that may need to ask 
a few more questions um, before a payment is sent and that they're comfortable that, you know, we've carried out all the due diligence that's necessary. Principally is making sure that the individual you are sending to is the right one and the bank account is, is the right one. Um, this verification process can vary between clubs, but essentially makes it, it, it involves steps to help you ensure that you are sending it to the right individual, particularly if there has been a change in the bank account, that's usually a red, red flag for us. Um, and uh, although it may take a slightly longer, uh, it helps to avoid any um, mishaps along the way. Um, in part, it's also helpful for us uh, to make sure that the individuals involved, uh, there are no sanctions concerns or financial crime concerns. And in that respect, we have a screening software that helps us uh, to identify any potential concerns that need to be investigated further. And so whilst, you know, looking at this in the round, it may seem like quite a an extensive amount of administration that needs to happen before you're simply allowed to send money. Um, I think it's 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 the way forward, and I think what we, what will happen eventually, the, the processes will become more streamlined, and it will be embedded into our processes. Um, so it, yeah, it's important to for us to remain vigilant and to keep that level of transparency with our correspondence. And actually in my role as a correspondent manager here at the club, part of what I've spoken today about has been shared through a series of um, regional seminars that the international group has hosted to make sure that these messages are being spread across the network and that there is a um, greater understanding that uh, whilst the digital world is a great thing and brings loads of advantages. Um, there are, we, we need to rem remain vigilant. And um, yeah, I think that the, the bo both can live in harmony. Uh, we just need to figure out the right balance. So um, yeah, I think that all that is left for me to do is say thank you or obrigado for your time. And I will pass you over back to Lucas. Many thanks, Gisele. We are the ones to thank you. Uh, and it was very, very nice to hear about uh, the club's perspective, uh, especially uh, out of uh, uh, Elia's initial perspective from a ship owner's view. Now hearing about the club, the rules, uh, correspondence guidelines, uh, your views on mitigating risks, identifying the flaws. And uh, most importantly, uh, as uh, you well covered uh, in the end, sharing the information, uh, not only from uh, one single club's perspective, but between the other clubs, as the amount of information and access to data and details uh, you have is enormous uh, from different members in different locations and different kinds of threats and risks. So sharing that is something very valuable to the whole industry. And uh, we thank you for, for also talking about this uh, with us. We already have uh, one question addressed to you in the chat, which uh, we will leave to, uh, to the final part of our event in the Q&A section and talking about uh, assessment of risks and uh, information. I will pass the word now to Lars Vogt. Uh, Lars will talk about the assessment of cyber threats and the role of Norma Cyber. Uh, Lars, uh, we are happy to have you with us and uh, feel free to open your mic. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope you can see my slides. Yes, we can. Perfect. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Uh, I'm really glad. And also, it was really interesting to hear the two former uh, speakers. It was lots of valuable points and also really great to see, uh, especially from Jose Elias, a managing director, uh, you know, uh, being part of such a uh, webinar today and being such so engaged into cybersecurity is really great to see. And I think it's uh, quite far ahead, many others. That's really, uh, really great to see from from my side as uh, setting up a cybersecurity center. So, so what I'll speak to you um, 
about today is Norma Cyber, Norwegian Maritime Cyber Resilience Center, which we established, as you said in the introduction, from, from 1st of January as a joint initiative for Norwegian ship owners and others within Norwegian maritime se uh, sector to, to address cybersecurity together, right? Um, so it's uh, two founding fathers uh, who are organizations who have established this, Norwegian Ship Owner Association and the Norwegian Worries, War, Worries Mutual. And, um, and the, both of them are, of course, Norway, but of course, Norwegian shipping is really international. And I know lots of these organizations are operating in Brazil and have Brazilian subsidiaries. So I hope this is also is relevant for, for this webinar and for, uh, for those of you who are listening today. So um, before I, I dig into Norma, uh, as Lucas mentioned, I will look and, uh, and give a presentation about the, uh, the threat. But before I, uh, our current assessment of the cyber threats, but before I do that, I normally kind of start with this thought experiment just to, to get, get us going here, right? So, um, so the thought experiment just, um, uh, to kind of talk us through that. And that, why am I doing that? I just want to show kind of how we are thinking when it comes to cyber risks. And I think it's more um, to it than kind of many things, right? So the thought experiments go like this, right? So we imagine two identical vessels, right? Two identical vessels with the same hardware, the same setup, the same technical systems, right? So they are identical, the same computers and all the, all the different IT stuff also. Uh, they are operating in two different areas of the world, right? Total different location, they have a different crew and they have a different ship management but the technical side identical. So the question is really then, uh, is the cyber risks towards these two vessels the same or is it different? Or will it, will it be different always or will it be the same always? So that's, that's kind of the question. And I, I don't really demand an answer from you today, right? Uh, but we could have done this as a poll, a uh, live poll, uh, but uh, I've done that before. And I, kind of the, I think most of us agree that the cyber risk towards these two identical vessels can or most likely will be different, right? But why is it different, right? Um, uh, and to explain that, I thought I would kind of reference to BIMCO cyber guidelines and kind of pull you through uh, what they say about cyber risks. They say that risks is kind of a function of three different aspects, impact, threats, and vulnerability. So I, I'll, I'll try not to make this too complicated, but I thought I would go through kind of the three different aspects, right? To kind of show the difference because, because when we're talking about cyber risks, these things are um, are matched uh, and uh, together, and many are talking about the different things here um, uh, in different ways. So I thought I'd kind of use this experiment um, uh, or this scenario to talk you through the different aspects. You can picture it like this also: impact, threat, vulnerability, and you see kind of the risk is the overlapping part in the middle. This is just a sketch; it's just a model. Yes, it's not the, the truth, but it kind of gives you an idea of what we are talking about here. So for impact, right? This is the impact towards your organizations. This is the assessment of what is your digital crown jewels, right? What are what types of um, systems, if they are impacted, will kind of hit you as a company and impact you as a company? Um, so to have a risk, uh, you need to have this component, right? The threat is quite simple, I guess, at least in practice, uh, at least in, in theory. Um, the threat actor their capability, their intention. This is often talked to as kind of a, a hypothetical ex, uh, thing, which can happen to anyone, but it is actually threat actors behind these things. They are actually, they have an intention, they have, cap have capability, right? And it's important to have that into the, to the match also. On the vulnerability side, this is where we often talk about the technical vulnerabilities within systems, right? That systems are vulnerable, you need to patch them and so on, right? And you need to segment and you need to do all these things. So you're often focusing on the kind of the technical things, but you also have to remember that the, the human element, as Jose Elias mentioned earlier today, 95% of the attacks are utilizing humans, right, to get in. So that is also a really important thing. And I normally categorize vulnerabilities into two, right? It's a technical vulnerabilities and the kind of the human aspects. So this is just to um, kind of um, bring you through what the BIMCO cyber guidelines are saying about, okay, how can you uh, assess your risk? Now, uh, when it comes to the scenario we were talking about here, right? The two different vessels, identically technical. 
meaning the impact, right? Two different companies, two different vessels, the impact can be very different, right? If this is a critical contract for the business, this is the one single vessel, uh, which is really critical for you, then of course the impact will be very different, even though the vessels are identical. If this is just one of your hundred and, or, and something vessels, and, and, and it's already lying idle, right? Perhaps in, uh, different types of cyber incidents won't have that big impact towards you as a company. When it comes to the threat, right? They are located two different places in the world. Yes, the cyber threats, they no, uh, don't know any boundaries, geographical boundaries, but um, there are some different things uh, which occurs on the threat side, depending on who you are um, uh, operating with on a contractual side, um, what the geographical area you are operating in. As, let's take an example. If you're operating with oil exploration in the South China Sea or in the Black Sea, it might be very different threat than if you're doing it offshore Brazil, right? Um, or if you're transporting um, uh, munition or kind of uh, arms into the Gulf, to a Gulf state, it's different than if you're, uh, you know, exporting tractors from Germany, right? So that's kind of the different when it comes to the threat, right? And especially when it comes to uh, the threat landscape, often if you have a business partner or if you are part of a critical national infrastructure, this is something you should consider, right, quite specifically. So this can also be different, right, for the two vessels. And when it comes to vulnerabilities, you might say that, okay, on the technical side, these two vessels are identical. So those technical vulnerabilities will most likely be the same. But as we already mentioned, right, the human factor here is really, really important. And as, as the other speakers also mentioned, you know, the training and awareness programs and actually making sure that your crew is trained and know uh, how to handle, uh, you know, phishing attempts, uh, other types of it, uh, attempts of cyber attacks is really, really crucial, right? Um, so why uh, have I highlighted this, and what, 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 uh, what are the biggest takeaways from this? The biggest takeaway, I guess, is okay. The technical things are really, really important. You should have the right technical team, the right IT expert to work for you, right? If it is it either internally or uh, through managed service providers. But there are much more to cybersecurity also, right? Other aspects. Uh, I think one other takeaway here is, okay, how can leaders engage in this, right? How can you engage as a leader when it comes to uh, addressing cyber risks? And I see, uh, and I've talked to many leaders, right? Who actually struggle a bit with how can we go about as a leader to engage in this? And I see many try to dig down into the different details, right, on the vulnerabilities, on the technical side, and try to cope with that. But you will never do that, right, because it's really, really complicated and really, really technically difficult areas. Uh, so you should probably know the, uh, uh, the main things, right, and be able to learn a bit about it. But the most important thing uh, I um, think for leaders to assess is the impact, right? To have an uh, uh, overarching um, understanding of the impact, the potential impact, uh, if your kind of digital crown jewels identify which systems they are and how can they impact you? Because that is something that leaders probably know more about, right? Than the technical personnel, because you know the business, right? So you know what is critical to you as a company. So that is something that I think the leadership should um, you know, focus on uh, and also, this will be the di direction, right, towards the others, towards uh, uh, focusing on what you're looking for on the threat side, on also focusing on what you're doing on the vulnerability side, right? So it means you will also do this more cost effectively, right? Because you're not securing yourself 360 all the time because you can spend millions and millions and millions of dollars on cybersecurity. But this will also uh, be a direction for the others, right, to assess the impact. So. Um, um, I will just kind of focus then a bit on the threat side. What are the actually threat picture we are seeing nowadays? So this is uh, the front page of our monthly threat assessment, which we distribute to all our members each month, which kind of highlights kind of low, moderate, high and critical threats and the different threat actors down from nation states, um, cyber criminals and cyber activists is what we cover here. So I won't go into all the details, but as I mentioned on the nation state side, if you are operating as a part of a nation's critical infrastructure or uh, uh, have or operating in one of these critical areas or for some of the opponents of some of these uh, nation states, you should be at least look into this and assess it. 
it will, will be ind independently for each company also. When it comes to ransomware, we just increased the threat from moderate to high on the last, uh, uh, last monthly threat assessment. And this is based on what we've seen for many months and uh, years already. Um, uh, we did um, uh, a special report which we distributed in April where we, had, where we examined or our analyst examined ransomware threats. They looked uh, in the deep and dark web to see basically the leak sites that these actors use. And they had identified 19 uh, organizations within maritime and logistics um, who have been a victim of a, of a successful uh, ransomware incident during uh, from um, uh, June last year until March this year. So that is actually kind of fact based because of that it has actually happened. And we see lots of different um, uh, commercial providers and others who are talking about the threat landscape and is, uh, is trying to, I guess, monetize somehow on kind of spreading that uncertainty about what is actually going on. So what we try to do here is kind of pull uh, it down and deliver a very true picture of what is actually going on and uh, contextualize it and also attach to that mitigation advice. Um, but the ransomware threat is uh, evolving and we have not identified so far that these groups are specifically going after shipping and maritime. That means they will be attacked or targeted, but not because they are shipping and maritime. It means because they are large companies with high turnover and so on. So we haven't identified any groups which are specifically going for this segment, which is a good thing, right? Something we, but this is something we monitor very closely because the big shift here is, of course, if we see threat actors going after operational technology, like maritime systems, maritime operational technology on board vessels, which we haven't seen yet either, but this is something we monitor very closely. And that is a potential shift ahead if some threat actors are actually been able to, um, to, uh, uh, to cause damage to a vessel OT system, right? And the consequence, potential consequence is much larger. That is something we pay very close attention to and try to assess the development there. Um, so over to Norma Cyber and what we are doing and uh, more generally about uh, the, the company we established from uh, ourselves from 1st of January. We started the pre-project in November 2019 and got the final board approval from uh, in October 2020. Um, so this is the kind of uh, um, what we are trying to do our, our mission is to, to uh, help Norwegian ship owners secure themselves better. This is the actual footprint of Norwegian shipping in 2019. And yes, you see uh, the footprint is of course everywhere. And you see uh, off Brazil, it's almost white, right? Lots of activity. Um, uh, and of course, all of these companies also have land-based offices also. I haven't highlighted them. All of these have, you know, the number of port calls, I don't have the number of, but each time perhaps they connect to Wi-Fi or connect to 4G. So this is quite complicated, but it's extremely important to, um, to look at this from a holistic perspective when trying to secure. Um, so why are we doing this? We, um, we, as I already kind of spoke about, increased risks in, in the, this domain. I think we all agree uh, they are increasing, especially when you see also increasing connectivity increasing uh, digital, uh, digital solutions, uh, the move towards autonomy. This is something which is not going to go away, I guess. Um, we have seen uh, quite a few of members of these two mother organizations have asked uh, them to do this. We see IMO 2021 resolution is a driver for many. Um, and we also know that there are significant um, uh, economy of scale within this area also. If you are able to go together, more companies as a whole, it will be more cost effective also. So we try to build this on a kind of an existing, existing, existing framework, which Norwegian Shipping have worked within for many years with Norwegian Shipping Association, uh, DNK and other entities from Norwegian authorities and also authorities from other countries actually, and also the most important part the ship owners. Uh, and operators in the middle, 420 ship owners and, and 3,400 vessels. They have been able to co collaborate uh, within security for many years already, right? Within piracy, within other type of co conflicts, all the way back to the First World War. So this, with having high trust, being able to share information, share best practice and so on, 
is something we want to build on uh, also in Norma Cyber. Of course, the content of these services will be different, but kind of the overarching structure and what we try to achieve will be the same. So our services for our members consist of three components, intelligence information sharing, where we, uh, uh, first of all, we encourage our members to report to us if they see something suspicious within their areas, we then anonymize, uh, take out confidential information and then share it with the other members and, and try to contextualize it. And also look at other sources, right? From other partners, uh, from commercial actors uh, and from other sources, as many sources as possible to get it as true picture as possible. So we can notify one member uh, if we see a specific thing or specific risk towards them. But we also deliver different types of reports on different uh, timeframes to support members decision making within this area and also attach that mitigation advice. When it comes to um, response services, we have a 24 seven uh, standby on the response services. Um, and where we stand ready basically to support the members uh, if the worst happens. Uh, security operations uh, is an additional service uh, for those who want it, but this is kind of where we take it to the next level. We have it operational now from June, where we actually are able to monitor and detect threats, where we establish a system for that, where we actually are able to monitor the systems, both on the vessels, if uh, also OT systems, if the member wants it, but also, and also, for example, the land-based systems, if, uh, if the member wants it, but where we actually are able to have a security operation center service, where we are monitoring and detecting threats real time. And it also ties in with the two other services. Um, um, these are just some examples of the report, just to give you a visual idea of what we're talking about here. We see the monthly report, you see the vulnerability report focusing on vulnerable systems. And also uh, to the right here, you see kind of more a topic-based report. So these go, go these reports go out kind of on a regular basis to our, our members, in addition to the other work we're doing. Um, these are our members as of now, 43 members have actively, actually uh, actively joined uh, so far, which is really great. But of course, we want uh, more to join also. And this is kind of an initiative. The more that joins, the stronger it becomes, uh, obviously. Um, we also want others within Norwegian shipping uh, or Norwegian maritime sector to join. If it's shipyard ports, certification societies or other, uh, they are welcomed if they find it useful. Uh, this is the team. We have set up a team now of eight, uh, eight employees of kind of a multidisciplinary team, uh, both with experience from the maritime and shipping sector, but also especially cybersecurity, but also OT and ship and vessel systems. Uh, this is our operation zone in Oslo, uh, which is operational now. And we also collaborate closely with DNK. They have the Intelligence and Operations Center. It's located on the other side of the corridor. And also three, four floors up uh, is the, 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 the Contingency Preparedness and Security Department in Norwegian Ship Owner Association. What does that really mean? That means that if we see a threat or a, an incident, both hitting the physical domain, right, uh, and the, uh, the cyber domain, we will very, be very well suited to support the member. So that concludes my presentation. And I'm ready to take some questions also, uh, if there's any for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lars. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank uh, King Cage for inviting me to co-moderate this uh, webinar. Very interesting and timely uh, webinar. And congratulate the speakers for so uh, outstanding presentations. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has shown us all uh, the resilience and importance of the shipping industry. By keeping up trading routes and offshore services, despite of so many challenges, imposed by the virus outbreak and restrictive measures. I would like to take this opportunity and pay tribute to the brave seafarers who have been still facing uh, effects of crew changes linked to border restrictions. I would like also uh, to inform you that the International Chamber of Shipping, along of industry and social partners are encouraging ships in ports and around the world to sound their horns at 12 noon local time on 25th of June 
in honor of IMO's Day of Seafair uh, to remind the world of the urgent need to vaccinate all seafarers. Uh, given all the presentations, and uh, we all know that the shipping industry is undergoing major and fast transformations. With early adoption of technologies applied to equipments and systems, both to reduce carbon emissions and increase operation efficiency. Global networks, cloud computer systems linked to operations of ships, we will allow more and more operational autonomy. And at the same time, we require an efficient and effective management system to reduce risks of cyber attacks. So I will start with a question to Giselle. Giselle, do you think that autonomous systems are more prone to cyber attacks? As a hi, Ricardo, thank you so much for the question. I would say that on our assessment of autonomous vessels, uh, we don't consider them more prone to cyber attacks. Our experience has been that they utilize um, very bespoke uh, codes. And um, as a result, uh, it's harder to infiltrate their system. So our assessment of these types of vessels has um, shown that hopefully by removing the human element uh, of the of, in the operations that there would be a decrease overall in in claims going forward but uh, i think the the future and the reality will, will speak for itself thank you giselle and lars could you comment what giselle just answered yes uh, thank you um I guess uh, from my perspective, I, as Giselle said, um, you know, the, the potential impact here, of course, if uh, autonomous vessel is hit by a cyber incident is, of course, uh, larger, um, perhaps also because you don't have a seafarer on board. You know? So, but um, I'm really confident that the technology they use, it is built from scratch, right? It's a modern system, systems. And uh, um, so I'm, from, from my perspective, I'm actually a bit more worried about the, leg, the company, older vessels trying to use autonomous solutions, right? Where we have a 20 year, 15, 20 year old system with legacy system, and then you try to use autonomous systems on top of that, right? You try to get out some efficiencies. I think there, I, I'm actually on the risk side, I'm, I'm more, um, that's a potential larger risk there, right? Because uh, uh, when you try to rebuild and put autonomous solutions on top of all systems, I guess uh, the vulnerability can be, be even larger, right? So. Okay, thank you. Jose Elias, could you also reflect on this topic? Oh, I, I tend to agree. Without being an expert, um, IT expert, technology expert, I, I tend to agree that if one of the main factors uh, recently that we, that we see is the human factor, no? Uh, uh, the autonomous vessels would have uh, some sort of uh, 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 a different approach uh, to that. So I think that's one. Also, the modern technology involved is more prepared to the future challenges. It's to be seen. I don't see this as an immediate threat. I have, of course, uh, as, a, as, a, as a human being myself, <laughs> I have uh, concerns about um, heavy machinery operating on its own. Uh, I think this is just uh, natural that we do have those concerns. I have uh, I have grown up under the uh, the influence of Terminator by Arnold Schwarzenegger. So when the machines revolt, so I I'm probably influenced by that. But <laughs> I tend I tend to trust technology. I tend to trust technology, so uh, let's go with a, a safe um, thumbs up for autonomous vessel. Okay, thank you. I think we have one question from the audience uh, to Giselle, uh, and I think the others could also make some comments. This is related to IMO, uh, I mean, requirements as of uh, January this year, uh, that companies should uh, uh, enforce that ICM code 
with a, a strict management uh, on, on uh, cybersecurity. And Giselle, could you comment on that? Do you think that this will help the industry? In terms of helping the industry, I think the fact that the IMO has introduced this specifically just reinforces the importance of cyber in our industry. Um, and taking the question um, that Paolo has put forward as to what effect this would have on a ship owner's P&I cover, I think, um, well, I'm not an underwriter, but certainly I understand that when assessing the risk profile of a ship owner and the operations that they are engaged in, um, absence of being IMO compliant would certainly be um, trickier. So if they can prove that they have implemented what is required under the IMO, it will always look favorably. If that, to say that that would immediately translate to cheaper insurance, I think it would be very difficult to say in isolation, but um, the overarching message is the more you can comply, the, the better it's going to be. Okay, thank you, Giselle. And Lars, what, how do you see the IMO uh, regulation on this topic? No, um, so I've been speaking to very many of our members on this topic also, and I think uh, we see kind of a different, very different uh, approach to how to cope with this from ship owner to ship owner. Um, unfortunately, the, the regulations are quite vague. It doesn't really say specifically what you need to do, right? So I think many of our members have used much re time and resources just to kind of get their head around how should they approach this in practice, right? So that's kind of a challenge for many of the ship owners. When that is said, I think it definitely has raised the bar, right? It means that perhaps those companies who haven't worked that much with cybersecurity aspects haven't uh, have kind of raised their maturity, perhaps. So I think that has happened. And it has also, I think, raised the awareness among leaders, right? Because then you have specific requirements is put on the agenda. So I definitely see that it's had an impact, but I also heard from others who have worked very structured within cybersecurity for many years that, okay, it's, it's not that big of a deal. You do have to just have to document these. So it's kind of a, a, yeah, a bit of a mixed back uh, feedback, yeah. yeah. And Jose Elias, do you think that the IMO uh, entering this uh, as of this year, do you think that this uh, increased awareness in the industry? I believe so. Um, I, I do believe so. I think it, it brings people more on the same level, the same line. I think it's a way to uh, ensure that the industry has a more uniform view um, on, on this important aspect. So everybody needs to think uh, the same as a base level. Everybody needs to be aware of the risks. Um, that risk, uh, which is initial, maybe a financial economical risk, can become a threat, uh, a life-threatening event, if uh, not careful. And uh, I know that uh, shipping in general and the oil industry, we are obsessed about safety. So we should be also in the same in the same page when it comes to cybersecurity, and this is changing. I feel it's changing, and I am all coming into the, the, this space is also a very important event. Okay, and I would like to ask you also, Elias. Uh, you've mentioned in your presentation uh, high uh, the, the the importance of the human factor on this uh, topic. Uh, could you perhaps reflect a little bit about the culture? Do you think that the Brazilian culture helps or not help this kind of, uh, of behavior? Do you think that depends on also the cultural uh, uh, aspects of, of the, on that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, 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 risks? Well, Brazilians are very open to internet, you know, so very embracing of, uh, uh, of social networking and, and, and internet in general. So. I would say that, yes, we are a little bit more of a target based on our social uh, interaction, uh, our social interaction ways. So yes, and we know also that the number of cyber attacks or cyber uh, security breaches in Brazil is quite high. 
So there's a lot of uh, hackers, there's a lot of uh, cyber crime here in Brazil. Um, so I would say, yes, there is a, a little bit of an additional risk here. Um, uh, there, there is also a, a gap of uh, awareness. So it, 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 that's why the organizations, uh, and we do that, have to invest a lot in training, awareness, reminders, because uh, you do the training, uh, people get, uh, uh, get aware and, and, and uh, establish certain behaviors for some time, but they tend to forget. Mm. You know? So you, you need to keep updating uh, that. We also do as an organization, sometimes we do tests. So sometimes we, we test the organization to see who clicks, not to punish, but to, to, to see how prone people are uh, uh, to, to, uh, to click on a phishing email. And yeah, it's, it's going to be a constant battle. It's going to be a, a process of uh, educating. And, and we had a global town hall on Tuesday with our CEO um, to make people aware that this is important. Uh, it's not like something that is nice to have or just a, a new program in the company. It's, it's, it's important. Uh, and, and the consequences of breaches can be very serious, as I mentioned, from uh, financial loss to very serious uh, uh, of uh, criminal offenses. Now, if you have a, a data breach uh, or uh, even uh, life threatening events in a more extreme case. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. And I maybe I think this would be a topic also to the basic education to, uh, you know, teach the kids how important it is to protect their data and accessing all these technologies. So, Lars, uh, uh, before I pass the, to Lucas, uh, could you comment a little bit about this culture aspect also sitting in Oslo? How do you see uh, almost more than 3,000 vessels operating all around the world? Yeah, so I, I should perhaps be a bit cautious about uh, specifically talking about the Brazilian culture from, from my office in Oslo. So, uh, but I think in general, I guess, uh, the cultural aspect is really important. What we see is, of course, when it comes to uh, one aspect, at least, which I think is interesting, is uh, how you see uh, on uh, authorities, right? How, how when you receive, especially a, a phishing email, like from someone pretending to be your CEO saying, okay, you should pay this and this, you say, okay, uh, some cultures are more prone to being, okay, yes, just do as you're told, right? Uh, not, don't question authorities. Um, uh, or if you see like uh, someone from your, uh, uh, you know, OT, uh, Markham OT provider um, saying to the seafarer, you know, you need to connect this ethernet cable into this just for, you know, some time because I need to access it. Okay, then you say just, okay, yeah, sure. So that's kind of, a, there you see differences between culture, right? Where you, but, and then and there's th that's actually something positive by, by you know questioning authorities or actually questioning someone to pretend to be be that at least um, that that's at least one one aspect mm. yeah. and, and Giselle do you think also this uh, cultural aspects of the human is uh, important to this uh, cyber risks and, and education is something we need to invest yes definitely I think education is is the building blocks of, of progression when it comes to being cyber aware. I know that um, I mentioned in my presentation, we have training and that involves online courses that you have to answer questions on. Um, you have to get a certain percentage correct. Otherwise you need to resit them. So it's not just sent circulating a written policy and hoping that everyone uh, reads it eventually. It's um, forcing people to really put their knowledge to the test and make sure that they understand what risks are out there and what we're doing as an organisation to try and circumvent um, those, those risks. And I think, yeah, if, if that education can be mirrored across the industry, then um, there's always room for error, but at least you can say you're doing everything possible to mitigate against uh, human error. Thank you, Gisele. Lucas, the floor is yours. Hey, thanks, Ricardo. And uh, thanks to all of you. I'd like just to add a few comments on, on Lars' presentation. Lars, I was very happy to see when you put up the list of Norwegian uh, 
members uh, that most of the companies are very familiar to us in Brazil. And uh, when we see the vessel's footprint, that Brazil plays an important role. I guess it's basically because we have Ricardo uh, heading the Norwegian Ship Owners Association and also Elias as the former president of the Norwegian Brazilian Chamber of Commerce. So we are very happy to see that. I have just a, a final question. We still have a couple of minutes. Uh, and uh, I would like, as we have here in the audience, uh, ship owners, brokers, uh, insurers, cargo owners, charterers, authorities, and risk advisors in general. And I would also like to, to comment that we have here making this session happen. Uh, Huji, who is the coordinator of the IT in our firm. And I want to try to lift some of the weight of his shoulders when I ask this, but I'd just like to hear from you very briefly. Uh, when we talk about cyber risks, uh, are we basically talking that, uh, is that a, just an IT problem uh, that we should leave that to the IT guys? Or do you have any other thoughts on that? The, the, the question was for me? Ah, it's for everyone, but you can start, okay. Lars. Yeah. Uh, I think I think I addressed this in, in my presentation. I mean, it's it's obviously something. Uh, I think you, you, um, it's definitely the IT aspect here. Yeah? It's really, really important. I think that's, and I know that very many of the IT guys and girls out there trying to defend the systems every day are doing a humongous job right with, with doing that. And it's really difficult because this is changing so fast within technology on both sides, right? On the defensive side and the uh, attack side, right? So that's really important. But I think also you have to, to see that this is bigger than that also. And I think you all, always see during a cyber incident that um, an organization uh, at some point understand that this is a a kind of um, a large cyber attack is an attack towards the organization is an organizational issue and uh, incident right rather than an IT incident because it affects so many aspects of your operations and uh, with not just the technical things so on the legal side on communication side on, on so many aspects so I think that's kind of uh, definitely and, and the solution is also not just technical right so I, that's that's at least my my opinion. Thanks, Lars. Uh, and Gisele, what do you think about this? Should we just leave for the IT people or is this a matter for us all? I think it's tempting to, to do that because you think <laughs> it's it's beyond me. I don't, I'm, I'm not very sort of technically able. So an IT, that's what they do for a living. So naturally they should deal with all of the cyber related incidents. But as Lars said, it, it really does um, affect every aspect of an organization and um, I think I mentioned it briefly in my presentation we have cyber security officers um, across the departments and that really I guess uh, shows that it's not just IT I mean IT will, will continue to be the department that highlights a phishing email that may have been sent around and alerts um, on a sort of uh, contemporaneous basis but they are by no means the um, only resource that we try to have within an organization so that we remain vigilant in every aspect. Because also I was chatting in my presentation about financial transactions to correspondence. And that's very much from a perspective of uh, dealing with claims on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, my colleagues in underwriting, in finance, um, will have slightly different concerns and um, it's very important to have a representative that understands the needs of that department and it's not just um, IT. IT is sort of the overarching department um, but it's, it's a group effort definitely. Indeed and Elias also covered that a bit right bringing that from a management perspective it's not a, just a matter of IT but if you have some just final uh, Comments, Elias, feel free to do so. No, I, I see that every security aspect in, in, in the company belongs to everybody, everyone. Of course, the IT uh, the, the department has the ability to set up the systems, to, to, to create the defenses, um, to, to keep the company up to date in, in terms of uh, the technological capabilities and the, the latest threats. But it belongs to everyone. It's like uh, the regular safety on board of ships, uh, uh, where you know people have the authority to stop dangerous work, 
have the authority to intervene in, in, in difficult situations. It, it should belong to everyone. It should be part of uh, uh, people's uh, uh, life. It's not yet fully because it, it is a relatively new uh, development. So people are learning how to deal with that as an organization. Uh, it, it, it's how do you interact with your employees uh, to raise that this is super important, this is essential and could be existentially, uh, could be an existential threat to a company in an extreme scenario. So everyone uh, should be part of it. Um, but of course, there is the, the, the technical group, the technical teams who are going to create the framework for that. You know, and, and the senior management in the team to make sure that this is disseminated and that uh, their teams are aware and, and feel accountable for that as well. Indeed, thanks. Uh, and uh, I regret we don't have more time to continue this uh, interesting discussion, but uh, it is with uh, great enthusiasm that on behalf of uh, Kincaid, I would like to thank uh, all the wonderful speakers, uh, Jose Elias, Gisele Villanueva, Lars Vold, and also Ricardo Fernandes for sharing the interesting views, for making this event possible. I would also like to uh, dedicate a special thanks to all the audience that is here today, uh, the attendees uh, that participated, and uh, invite all of you not only to follow our future events, but also if you'd like to have any specific topic on the agenda, we are open to receiving suggestions. Uh, we'll keep you informed in our mailing list about future topics, future events uh, that we still want to run throughout the year of uh, interesting subjects such as this one. And hope uh, you all stay safe and uh, we can see you again each other soon. Any thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Pleasure. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah.